Okay, well, welcome back to another AI Marketing Stacks podcast. And today I'm here with Maria uh, Sparagas, who is the founder of Direct, it's Direct Pay Payments, right? Direct Pay Net. Direct Pay Net, excuse me. So she's the founder of Direct Pay Net. She's been in the online space for a long time. Actually, before we started, she was telling me her long and storied history, which I will <laughs> maybe have her have her recap because it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, and she's well known in the space. If you're watching this, chances are you've seen um, her podcast and seen some things that she's up to. So I'm really, really excited to have her here today to talk about what she's up to, um, especially when it comes to AI, when it comes to marketing her own business and really just her story. Because like I said, um, she has roots that go back, um, you know, to a lot of the origin of, of stuff that we're doing today. And so I think those are really, really interesting to hear. So Maria, welcome. Thank Thanks you so much. Here. Thank you. Awesome. So I, actually, if you don't mind, I would love, <laughs> I know you just told me the story, but um, can you give me the potted version of your, the origin story from your first, you know, time in the online space until up till now and being the founder of uh, Direct Paynet? Sure. So um, I've been in the space for a long time uh, in the online world, as I was telling you. So this, the, my journey started in, in 2005, kind of straight out of school, um, did a couple of corporate jobs, was not super enthusiastic about it. And the internet was kind of the new and exciting space. Um, unfortunately, it was just very difficult to find a job in anything tech related back then, because there wasn't any formal position. So um, a couple of friends of mine decided that they were going to start affiliate marketing on their own. Uh, and I thought it was pretty exciting. And I, I was a little bit of a risk taker when I was young, still now, like in the sense of like, yeah, I'll leave my corporate job, go join them. If it doesn't work out, I'll just find another job. I was never kind of worried about finding work even back then. Um, and so I joined in and there was just, they were doing some affiliate stuff, making like a thousand bucks a day. Um, and then, uh, I realized as I had joined the team that it was affiliate marketing for adult entertainment sites. Uh, I was the only woman there. I was quite young. The porn industry now is a little bit more acceptable, I guess, for certain people. I mean, everybody has their own, uh, you know, feelings about that industry. Uh, but back then, you know, being a woman in the business side of porn was not a very well regarded thing. Yeah. Uh, but I found it very exciting. I was learning so much about, you know, different tools online and, um, you know, affiliate marketing and all that stuff. So I just decided to stay on and we were making some good money. And I was like, well, this is working out for me. Um, you know, after a little while, uh, the team I was working with decided that they were going to launch their own pay sites. Uh, and that turned into browsers.com, uh, which I'm sure a lot of people know. And, uh, you know, still to this day, <laughs> you it's know, still don't thriving pretend. <laughs> and, and, and it's doing well. Um, and then we launched, uh, Pornhub and obviously there's a lot of stigma on that site. I haven't worked on that site for over 10 years. So I, you know, I'm not involved in anything day to day, but I was there actually when we launched Pornhub, which was a very exciting day. Wow. I have to say like looking at traffic and all that stuff. Mm. Um, so during my time there, you know, we were small, lean and mean and doing kind of a lot of stuff. And I was very like operations type person, like what can we do to, you know, make more money, be more efficient and so forth. Um, so I, I, I helped launch, you know, the affiliate program, manage the affiliate program there. So I learned a lot about that stuff. And then uh, I went into kind of the finance side of the business, like where are we losing money? Where are we making money? How can we make more money in those areas? Uh, and I realized payment processing was a really big uh, problem in terms of cost. Like, why are they taking so much? They were charging close to 15% per transaction, plus taking a 10% reserve for every transaction. Uh, and if anybody has reserves with their merchant account, they know it's a pain in the ass to get them back. So, you know, it was just 25% of our money was gone. So I kind of looked into that a lot. It became my full-time job. I built a 10 person team on payment processing for the company. Um, and I really learned the ins and outs of payment processing there. And if anybody's worked in, you know, either gambling or porn, and in payment processing, you really get the best education on anything financial related in mm -hmm. these companies. Um, so I got really, really good at it. And I was managing, you know, tons and tons of merchant accounts and, and volume and companies and so forth. Uh, in 2010, the owners that I had kind of uh, started with decided to sell the company for 
nine figures. Um, and I decided that it was time for me to exit. It was getting very corporate. It wasn't something that I wanted to do like corporate level. Um, it was a big team that bought it and they wanted to kind of proceduralize a lot of stuff and so forth. Uh, I mean, with reason, the business was growing quite a bit. Um, so I decided to exit, took some time off, uh, started thinking, what's my next step? I went into kind of like a consulting thing, thinking I wanted to be a solopreneur, really just kind of focus on some consulting stuff. And I was helping other adult companies. And it was the start of supplements and nutraceuticals in 2010, whereas mm -hmm. Veritrol and all those kind of like one pager free trial offers were coming into the scene a lot. Um, so I was helping a lot of different merchants kind of do their setup and make sure that they don't lose their mids and so forth. Um, and after like a year or two of doing that, I realized um, I should be making recurring revenue if I wanted to kind of, you know, get to the next level, like charging consulting and so forth only goes so far. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have so many hours a day. So I decided to start my own payment processing company. So direct payment started kind of like as a consultancy type thing. Um, and then I just made my own banking relationships um, and started kind of mass marketing a little bit cold traffic, getting more uh, people in my sphere. And now we process for US businesses, European and UK. So we have banking kind of uh, both sides of the pond. I uh, have a nice team. We focus on, like I said, high risk merchants. Um, and as I was telling you earlier, high risk right now is pretty much 90% of online businesses are high risk. If you have anything subscription, if you're selling supplements, if you have a coaching offer, if you have an education offer, it's all considered high risk per stripes, terms, and conditions. So, mm. um, you know, it's always good to have a backup and to work with multiple players to ensure you don't cause any bottlenecks. So my team really, we're marketers, you know what I mean? Like we're marketers that understand payment processing. So we bridge the gap between these two awesome. things. Um, and that's what a lot of our clients like about us is that we can speak business. You know, we're not just bankers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one, I love, I love that story. And I love mm -hmm. that, um, that you were there at the origin because you had mentioned before we started about how like a lot of people who are OGs in the internet space, you know, you're not going to name names, although you have a, <laughs> you have your black book somewhere, <laughs> but a lot of people, a lot of the OGs got their start in, in the adult space. Um, and then you were also there, you know, when, like you mentioned, you know, resveratrol and nutraceuticals were, were launching. Um, but I, I have two questions for you. Let me ask the first one, which is, when you look at the trajectory of your career, like obviously it's pretty unconventional, your start. Um, what do you think contributed to your success in terms of like the decisions that you made or the way you approach situations or maybe like the mental talk that you had? What do you think was going on for you internally that's contributed to um, the success in the career that you've had? I think if I was like talking to the old me, the one thing that I'd be proud of myself is that uh, at a young age, I, I didn't have much fear in terms of my career. And I mm. think a lot of younger people who are starting are always worried like, you know, oh, I'm working at this company. What if I leave and I start something else and it doesn't work out? Well, thankfully for me, it was kind of like, I didn't care if it didn't work out. Not, mm. not, you know, obviously I cared about making money and so forth. I was actually very, very, um, I wouldn't say greedy, but just very motivated by money at a young age because uh, my parents didn't have any. So I always strived to make money. Mm. Uh, but, you know, in my 20s, uh, early 30s, I was, you know, I didn't have as many responsibilities as I do now financially. So it was like, well, look, if I can't, if I start something, if I start direct paying it, for example, and it doesn't work out, well, I'll just start something else or get a job somewhere else or do something else. So just kind of not being worried about taking a chance at, at a young age, I think was kind of the key to me becoming an entrepreneur and, and being able to succeed. And every year I thought my business was going to close down. Um, you mm. know, in 2015, um, I had like a huge, huge issue. I was working a lot with, uh, clients in Panama, uh, and, and the, you know, if people were around at that time, there was something called the Panama papers, which caused a huge issue with the U S government in Panama and, and business relationships. And the Panamanian bank literally closed my whole portfolio, almost like cut my business off. Cause we were doing a lot of business there. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was like, that's it. We're done. Like, how am I going to rebuild this huge, like steam engine portfolio that I had built in Panama? Um, 
And sure enough, I was able to do it. And I went to Europe and I said, okay, let's start. And, and it's like, almost starting the business off from scratch at that point. Cause I was so focused on Panamanian business. So, mm -hmm. you know, every time I think I'm down, I just figure something else out. You know, it's just kind of not, not being stuck in one place and just keep going. How, how do you keep your, your mentality when you're in, in a situation like that, when you're dealing with every, the everyday stress of running a business. And then when you get hit with something like that, that's kind of big and you feel like, you know, everything I worked for is, is, is done, right. We got to pack it up. What, um, what do you do to have a, like a strong mentality in that situation? Well, actually the worst part of that story is that I got the call from the Penny Manian bank on my birthday. Wow. It was literally my birthday. I answered. I thought my rep was calling to wish me a happy birthday. I wow. was like, so naive. So, mm. I mean, it, it really caught me by surprise. Um, I mean, for me, what I, I don't know, like it sounds kind of simple, but I really give myself like 24 to 48 hours to sulk. I really like, I scream, mm. I cry, I complain nonstop and, and just all that. And then depending on how serious, really serious, it's two days, not so serious, <laughs> it's one day. Um, and then I just get up and go, just keep going, keep going. You know what I mean? Um, find another bank, find another client, move clients. Like my clients were calling me at that point. What am I going to do? Okay, let's find another bank. So, you know, for me, that particular situation, I literally got on a plane, went to Europe and said, I'm going to go to these three countries. Cause I know the banking um, is good in those countries. And I hit up like 10 banks and said, Hey, I'm going to come for a meeting with your rep and we're going to see what we can do. And mm -hmm. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was like, well, you know, this is how relationships are built. A lot of them are, are face to face. Uh, and sure enough, I found somebody who was friendly to my cause and was willing to help me with corporate structures to move clients over to get, you know, the tech stack going and so forth. And that's it. I mean, it's, it, it sounds easy. It was, it, it was a lot of work, but you know, my motivation is that, you know, I like being an entrepreneur and it's part of the challenges and it, it almost excites me a little bit. Sometimes when things are too easy, I get a little bit bored. I shouldn't mm. jinx myself like this, but you know, sometimes <laughs> like you get, you get thrown a wrench in life and you're like, oh shit. But they're like, you know, in the end, it's like, it, it's what keeps life and business exciting. If it was always the same, then I might as well just go work for like the government or something. Right. 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 So what do you think is your superpower? Uh, I am extremely determined. Like, it's just, it's, it's one thing and I can do something like, uh, you know, my family says this about me all the time. It's, I, I can keep doing something over and over and over again. Like I can, I just never ending energy when I have a goal, I just keep going. So, mm. um, perseverance, I guess maybe is the best word. Yeah. it's awesome. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about um, let's talk about marketing overall. Things that are going on in marketing. So this is the the second question that popped to mind was, um, having seen like being at the the origin of, you know, probably the biggest adult website of all time, right? To you know seeing what's going on in nutraceuticals. To I imagine being involved in the day to day of a lot of different companies and a lot of different businesses, understanding how they're doing their marketing and the way that they're structuring their business right because you're dealing with the financials what do you see as you know what are some of the lessons the biggest lessons that you see you know over the last years that you've been in the industry that are relevant today um, and the way things are going the way things are changing I mean since I started in 2010 um, I could say the one thing that is always, always comes back is, you know, the marketers that are putting out the scammy offers and the offers that are trying to mislead people, they always crash and burn. They always do. It just, it's even in 20, you know, there's people like these days, they say, oh, the good old days back then and so forth. Like I have seen people make millions of dollars a month and then a year later be broke. Mm. Why, why do you so think that is? Well, because, you know, especially like in the early days of nutraceutical, it was like, oh, I'll cure cancer with your pill or free plus shipping and never cancel, you know, the subscriptions and so forth. That stuff catches up to you. You know what I mean? People are not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to have, most people are not going to have, you know, a hundred or two hundred dollars go through their credit card every month without noticing forever. Right. So, you know, if you're not, if you're not really, you know, there's a big emphasis, I think right now, a lot more in like 
you know, your product and making sure you have a good product and making sure, but even back then, even though people made easy money, it was easy, come easy, go. You know what I mean? It was not, I, I kind of laugh a little bit with this whole, like it was the wild west back then and so forth. Yes. But you made a, you know, six to 12 months of revenue. And then you were toast. You were nothing. You burn mm -hmm. all your bridges. You know, if you stiff affiliates, nobody wants to work with you again. You stiff your payment processors. Don't come back to us. We don't want your business again. So it, it, it it's always the same, you know, being honest and being, you know, uh, as honest as you can be, because, you know, in marketing, you always have to kind of, there's a line you shouldn't cross. And then sometimes you can get close to that line, depending on what your goal is, but always making sure that you're, you're doing things properly in your marketing, that you're actually selling a product that you believe in that has some merit. Um, and, you know, obviously people are going to complain about it and stuff like that. There's always going to be haters, but not completely scamming people or making misleading claims. You know, that's mm -hmm. the one thing that's been continuous throughout my career. I've seen mm -hmm. time and time again. What about lessons that, that have been forgotten? Right. Any lessons that that people had or, or things that people were doing, you know, 10 years ago or at the start of nutraceuticals or whatever that they're not doing today, that would be be helpful. I mean, back then we used to do I used to see a lot of like cross sale offers um like cross sale meaning on your checkout page like now and just like through your cart a lot of people have upsells right so they have different products and so forth i still think that there's you know something to be said of offering a product or service that's not yours but somebody else's that might be complementary to something and just kind mm -hmm. of like making an affiliate commission and so forth i used to see that a lot more like a lot more trading of like you know i guess we call the i call them cross sales, but like, I don't know, whatever affiliate sales, I guess, but in the checkout process, that was something, especially in the adult space, we used to do it all the time. Like you buy a mm -hmm. membership to browsers, we'd sell you a membership to something else after, and we'd get an affiliate commission. And then like, if people like that product better, that's fine, you know, and then we get their traffic. So a lot of that, I'm seeing a lot less of that. I'm seeing a lot mm -hmm. of upsells now, but upsells of things that you know, merchants are creating themselves, mm. which sometimes don't work as well as like an alternative product. Right. So that's, that's mm. one thing. Um, you know, other than that, I mean, it's, it, it has evolved in the way like marketing and the, and the marketers that we work, they worked with, they evolve in the way that they do things, but marketing has stayed very similar. And I think if you go to print marketing and TV marketing, it's always, you know, the, the the human psychology is always the same. It's just the medium that's changed, right? Yeah. And and why why do you think the the cross sales are less common now? If you had a guess. I mean, a lot of people don't want to tie their name to another product or service. I think, you know, there's been a lot of scam offers and so forth. And, you know, I know personally, a lot of people who were doing cross sales and stuff like that, and they got stiffed affiliate commission, or, you know, they, 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 they weren't, you know, the, the products weren't shipped. It ruins, it tarnishes your reputation. So relying on somebody else, you know, it kind of, it, it kind of like, you really have to have a lot of trust in people if you're sending your customers there. Cause if they have a bad experience there, they tie it back to you. So I think that's pretty much the reason. Okay. So what are you working on now that is the most exciting thing to you? Are they in business or I don't know. Um, I'm actually, I mean, the, the one challenge that I always have myself is HR, um, mm -hmm. human resources, managing teams and, and, and finding the, the correct position. So like as a business owner, we have, you know, a lot of tasks to do. One of the most difficult things I have found is that creating a job, like creating the job that would respond to different things. Like it's easier to say like, okay, he's buying traffic and so forth. But in my business, for example, you know, we have a little bit of marketing, a little bit of sales, a little bit of banking, and then we have two regions and then we have a lot of support tickets. So there's a lot of stuff. And sometimes it's like, okay, I want the support guy to also be a little bit in sales. I want, uh, you know, my content writer to also answer some customer service so they can understand what customers are asking and just kind of being able to structure positions so they make sense and finding the right candidate has been, uh, you know, one of my biggest challenges. So I've really this year 
uh, I would say in 2022, really kind of looked at everybody's role. Like, what are we doing? Who's doing what? How can we be more efficient? Um, and just given uh, proceduralizing the business more, SOPs, uh, all that stuff. So that's been one of the things that is I would say exciting because what it does is it frees up my time to do other things that I find exciting, like, you know, content, uh, podcasting and all that stuff. It's just fun stuff that I do on the side. But obviously if I have a lot of business stuff, it just gives me a lot less time to do that stuff. Um, and also like on the personal side, just having a little bit more time to myself, it's a foreign thing for me. Cause I've always mm. worked a lot, uh, mm. not to be cliche, but I, I just, I did enjoy it. It didn't bother me. It's not like some people are like, Oh, you shouldn't work this day. It, I just do what I, I always worked six days a week. It was something that I did kind of like my whole life since I was a teenager. Um, and now, uh, I have a family now, so I decided to take weekends off. So that's pretty exciting. Just not doing something on Saturdays. Like, Oh my gosh, I have mm. a day off. Like, what should we do? So, um, yeah, I is, mean, it's, is it hard? it's, it's, it, it you know what? The, the hardest thing is sometimes, let's say on a Thursday afternoon, I want to do something for, let's say my son's school, because I'm volunteering, um, doing some stuff there. Like I'm always like, I'm still to this day worried something like yeah. terrible is going to happen during that afternoon. And I'm not going to be there. And like, who's going to be able to handle it and stuff like that. I get stressed a little bit, like with stuff like that, because I'm a little bit of a control freak, I guess, when, when it comes to that. Uh, but I would say in the last six months, I've, I've hired a couple of new people that have really, you know, uh, done well with keeping me calm in terms of like getting stuff done. So, uh, it's exciting. Cause it's not a skill that I'm very good at building teams was never something that I was like really great at. I'm very good at like procedures, finance, uh, you know, tech stuff, like learning integrations and all that. But like the people side of the business was always something difficult and I'm, mm. I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, with the, with the team building. It's, it's a, a work in progress, obviously, because things change, but it's, it's the first year that I feel pretty confident, um, that I have all the, the pieces in place for on my chessboard for the business. That's amazing. That's amazing. What, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned in this like HR hiring team building journey? Um, fire fast. Mm. So when somebody's not working out, like if it's just not a good fit, um, I feel like as a business owner, it's in my gut. Like I feel it. I'm like, this person is just not whatever. And you usually know that I would say six to eight weeks in, you're like, mm -mm. you know, uh, in the past, I'd, I'd kind of drag things like, okay, let's try this. And, you know, let's maybe give them this and change that. It's like, sometimes it's just not the right fit and uh, not feeling bad about it. You know, because if it's not the right fit for me, it's not the right fit for that person. So they may not be reaching their potential by working for me. So um, that's my my biggest lesson is like letting somebody go is not necessarily a bad thing. And sometimes, you know, um, you you get let go and you find a better, better suited position for you. So kind of free the person to find their full potential. Awesome. I love that. So I want to shift a little bit to talk about um, talk about AI. We'll talk about how you're using it in your business. So, yeah. you know, what what AI tools are you using and, you know, what what workflows have you set up or how has it changed the way you do certain processes? Um, yeah, tell me a little more about that. So, I think I mean we're <clears throat> we're big on content. We have a blog, like Direct Payment has a blog that's uh, that's fairly popular, I would say in the payment processing space. It's a geeky blog. Like if you mm -hmm. want to learn <laughs> about like geeky payment processing stuff and how things get done and so forth, you know, um, we're a good source of information for that. So um, there, there's like a lot of unique content pieces on there. So I've been toying a little bit with AI in a sense. I'm scared actually to use AI to write content for us because mm. I don't know how to prompt it properly. And a couple of times, you know, with ChatGPT, I prompted it and I was like, Ugh, this is so like terrible. This is like really crappy stuff. Uh, and I have a content writer and he's tried as well. And I still don't find like, I like his content. I don't like the content that chat GPT produces. And I think it's just a practice thing as well. Like it might just be that we don't know how to use it that well. And we haven't spent that much time, but one thing that works for us is, you know, my YouTube channel, um, it doesn't necessarily have, you know, 20, 30,000 views or anything like that. It has, has a couple of thousand views on each, uh, on a lot of like popular topics. Um, so I said, why don't we use AI 
for content generation on the YouTube channel. Mm. Um, so we've played with 11 labs, um, you know, for voice and so forth. Um, it's, it's good. Like it, it's, it's good. Uh, I still feel like you need an editor. It just doesn't, the intonation of things, the sentence, the way it kind of does like these run on sentences and so forth. Like it's cool. It's, I feel like it's still, it's not a super big time saver for me yet. Right. Um, like it, it, it does well, but, um, I think maybe in a couple of months, like, as we just started this, like about two months ago, um, and you know, the, the, the the premise of it is cool, but you realize as you use these AI tools, and, and that's the thing that I, I I kind of laugh a little bit about is like, you know, people were like, oh, AI is going to kill all jobs. There's not going to be any jobs left for marketers. There, there's going to be robots taking over the world. I'm like, no, because these tools always need the human to kind of like intervene and be like, no, that's not how you say that. And then, and then you know, maybe in some dystopian future in like 50 years that like it'll gather enough intelligence. But I think you know, anybody who's alive now is pretty good, um, mm. in terms of like finding work and marketing and all that stuff, because I, I actually have, since we started using these tools, I actually have more work for my mm. team than I did before. So I was mm. like, I don't know what people are talking about that. This is taking work away. This is actually adding work. It also gives us more content, right? So it's like, okay, well, we have more content. We can do more, we can release more stuff and, and so forth. So the voice AI stuff is really cool. It's cool and very scary. Mm -hmm. That's like, it's just kind of two trails of thoughts that I have, you know, like, uh, you know, voice verification and all that stuff. Like I'm, you know, you know, ultimately I'm a banker and stuff like that. So I see a lot of risk, Mm -hmm. uh, associated with that stuff. And I, I still think that banks and like government and so forth are always kind of the last to adapt because they're, they're just slower. Um, so stuff like that scares me, but, uh, I think, you know, I have, faith in humanity that we're going to figure this out and we're going to figure out how to use it properly and so forth. Uh, I mean, yeah, the, the AI voice stuff also will create a ton of content, which will create a lot of noise, I think on social media. So that's another yes. area that I'm like cognizant about. And, you know, the, the one thing, like when we tested chat GPT and so forth, it brings up stats that sometimes I'm like, is that a real stat? Like, is that a real number? So there's also fact checking when you're using these tools, yep. you know? So, um, you know, we're, we're dipping our toes, uh, a lot in, you know, like voice and, um, and content, I would say like, it's more focused on the YouTube stuff. Like, so more voice stuff for now. Um, and I'm also kind of looking at editing, you know, right. So like we have a long form, uh, I can't remember the name of the tool, but there's like this tool that you, you pop your video in and it kind of creates reels and all that stuff for you. Some are good. Some are not so good. Yeah. Uh, but it's, Opus? It's, Opus, yes, maybe? yes. Opus. Opus. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's Opus. Yeah. So, um, it, it does well. And sometimes, you know, it'll create, let's say 20 or 30 reels. You'll like two of them, but sure. you know, Hey, why not? Right. Um, so, so that's it. But like, for me, I, I don't, I can learn all this stuff. I prefer to have other people do it for me so I can focus on other stuff. Thankfully, I have the, the, I'm able to do that. I can have other people do stuff for me. Um, so I don't like get involved super in the day to day of this, but I could say that like, since we're, we're working with AI tools, I have been a lot more involved, especially with the voice stuff. Cause I was like, well, I just want to make sure it says it properly. I want to make sure yeah. it sounds good. And I want to make sure that it like, it's not saying stuff I don't want it to say and, and all that stuff. And and to clarify your, your, are you taking written content, running it through 11 labs with your voice? So it, it speaks and then publishing that on YouTube. Yeah. Is that sort of the flow? So are yeah. these, are these like blogs that were written? Yeah, it's, it's more, um, like we use, you know, like tools like answer the public, uh, and like SEO, you know, content generators. So we can try to get like SEO, uh, things that are going to rank well. Um, and then we always add like kind of the Maria touch to it. Like, cause there's always like something that's like a little bit more businessy oriented and so forth when it's the blog content, Uh, It's really just meant for SEO and to provide some information for people. So that is usually just kind of copy paste. But when it comes to like actual content, there's a production behind it, meaning like we do 
as you said, exactly what we do, but there's also the intervention of, you know, my content writer, there's my intervention, there's the editor. So we're all still doing everything. And what we're trying to figure out is how can we push it out faster so we can just kind of get it going. So right now it's a little bit slow because there's a lot of stuff, but we're getting to learn these tools and, and using them more efficiently. So I think like, you know, hopefully I can like, you know, 5X the amount of content that I do within the next year, which would be amazing. Just more eyeballs, right? Can I ask you about your this content journey because when i when i think of you um like i've seen your i've seen your content all over right i know you have the podcast and i've seen you in a lot of different places and i mean even now in 2023 you know there's obviously a lot of marketers who have gone 100 percent into into content create tons of content but you're someone in our space who um i see really putting out a lot of content and doing it consistently and doing it at a high quality so what was your journey like what what really inspired you to be like, I'm going to go hundred percent. And, um, and then what lessons have you learned as you've kind of been on this journey? So I started, uh, I started the blog in like 2016, mm -hmm. uh, content blog. So prior to that, I had a website that I built myself in 2010 on template monster. Um, all I did was really to get business. I would go to like a lot of trade shows like affiliate summit tnc all, all these different things uh i'm i'm quite personable i can like talk my way into conversations i'm not a shy person pretty extroverted so i'd always kind of make a lot of friends and um you know see if there was anybody i can work with and i always want to work with people who want to work with me so i i don't i didn't i never did this like very pushy sales tactics but it seemed to work up until 2016 pretty much all of my business was referral. It was like one person referred me to this person, that person. And, and, but it was a lot of traveling. I would say probably once a month I was gone for a few days, uh, sometimes a little bit more. So it was kind of taking a toll on me after that many years. I was like, the only way I could get business is by going to other shows and meeting other people. And, and, you know, I, it, and then the work start, starts piling up and you're like, if I have to take a one week trip, that means one week of kind of like not working and I'm all over the place and then getting back. Um, and then all, also I decided I wanted to have a family and kind of, you know, take, start that phase of my life. So I was like, well, how am I going to do this? Like, I can't, you know, have a baby and travel a week out of the month and go all over the place. So I started a blog in 2016 mm -hmm. when it was very unpopular to start a blog. I was like, why are you like, who starts a blog? Wasn't that like 2003 or something? And I was like, mm -hmm. well, I got a lot of stuff to say. And I feel like let's start documenting all this stuff. And, you know, maybe it'll bring something. I didn't know what I was doing in the sense of like, I was just writing stuff that I thought was interesting for me and so forth. Um, and then, you know, I had an assistant at that point. She's like, hey, how about we you know, kind of like maybe look for like SEO terms and try to formalize it and so forth. Um, and, you know, the first time we made a sale from like a cold lead on the blog, I was like, hmm. eh, that's not bad. And I was like, <laughs> this guy doesn't know me. And it is like, you know, he just wants to work with me because he read something. So it kind of gave me a little bit of motivation. I was like, you know, I gotta, I work with so many marketers. I'm like, why am I not working on cold traffic? Like I can't just keep working off referrals and mm. I need some cold traffic. I need to open my circle and so forth. So, uh, doubled down on the blogging, started publishing like once, twice a week, like very, very consistently. Now we publish a lot more, uh, really got like some tools, got, um, when, when, when the blog started kind of paying itself off in terms of time, I got like a writer who writes all the pieces and so forth. Um, and really it's still to, to this day, our main driver of traffic, wow. uh, you know, despite all the other stuff, the content that we do and so forth, the, the blog is what does the best, uh, mm -hmm. for us. And then in, uh, in 2020, like, uh, I had just been to copy accelerator, uh, with Stefan and Justin and so forth, and just met a lot of marketers and stuff like that. And I was like, I just, I want to put out something new. Uh, I'm not a writer. I'm not a copywriter. Uh, I joined Copy Accelerator just because it was a nice business community. I wanted to learn what other people are doing and stuff like that. And I said, it's, it's this cool. I like the vibe of this. Um, and my medium is voice. Like I just, I, I'm good at explaining things. I'm good at talking to people and so forth. So I was like, why don't I kind of try to use what I'm good at? Um, and in fact, actually, um, you could tell Stefan, he inspired me because he started a podcast. Um, and I was like, you know, this is pretty cool. Like I should, you know, maybe I should 
do something like a podcast. And I was like, who's going to listen to me? What, what am I going to talk about? I was like, whatever, let me just get a couple of people that I know, a couple of friends that I know that could be on my podcast. So we could just like, like what we're doing now, we're just talking about stuff and you know, whatever. And then I'll, I'll throw in some kind of solo episodes of me, like talking about, you know, uh, checkout pages and all this stuff. And I just recorded whatever I felt like it was like, Oh, I want to talk about checkout pages today. I just flip on my camera. Let's talk about checkout pages for like 20 minutes. And then that's it, you know? Um, and, and, and that's how it materialized. It was, it was right. Like around the time of COVID I was like, I needed a new project. I'm, I'm, I'm based out of Canada, Montreal, Canada. And it was like, I think, you know, not to go back to that terrible time, but like, it was extremely isolating. Uh, it's extremely difficult. Like I, I, I was working at an office up until then with my team and our office closed down because it was like we we weren't allowed to go there anymore, as yeah. silly as that sounds. And then I started hiring some more offshore talents and so forth. So we actually never went back to an office setting. But during that time, it was a really big change for me. Like I was like, I, I had a, 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 a my young son at that point, uh, which for a lot of moms, uh, you know, maybe listening is, is it's pretty isolating when you're first, like the first year or so that you have a kid. Cause like you have this kid like hanging off of you. Um, and like, you can't do anything. You can't go anywhere. Right. And, and then COVID and I could, I literally could not go anywhere. So I was like, maybe I should start a new project, <laughs> which right. most people would be like, don't do this. You have already so much <laughs> on your hand. Uh, but I was like, I'm going to start. That something was your way new out. And- yeah. Yeah, I was like, it's just going to be something I just do for for fun. I didn't have any intention. And then it started doing pretty well. And like we then again, same thing as the blog, we got like our own, the first lead from the podcast. I was like, oh, my God, somebody like listen and wants merchant account. That's so cool, you know. Uh, and and now it's like I said, you know, it's it's not, you know, uh, we're no Alex Hormozzi channel or anything like that. But, um, you know, we get a couple of thousand uh, people every month kind of tuning in either on the podcast or the YouTube channel and so forth. And, uh, you know, we're getting some really good fan mail because I think I'm being very authentic. Like I'm, I'm you know, sometimes I, I'll say like, you know, you shouldn't work with me. You should work with Stripe because this is why, you know. I, it's, I, I give very impartial information. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's my thing. I just want to inform people. And if it's a good fit for us to work together, awesome. You know? Uh, and I think people are, are, are liking that vibe because, you know, it's, it's, it's not, you know, come to direct pain it and we can for sure help you. Cause sometimes we can, you know, we, we don't, we, we can't focus on every industry and do everything. So, um, you know, it's been three years. We've changed directions on the podcast quite a few times. We went from like interview style podcast audio, then, okay, let's focus on short form uh, video on YouTube. And then we went back to kind of medium form on you on, on the channel, on the the podcast channel. And now I'm, I'm really focusing on, like, I really focused on in kind of the second part of 2023, what's working, like what is bringing me traffic, what is making me sales, what is the best use of my time and time and time again, what was bringing me the most kind of bang for my buck was really the kind of 10 to 15 mar- a minute marketing episodes, like mm. a couple of checkout page things, um, things you can do with Stripe, uh, maximize your, your, your conversions, all that kind of stuff was always bringing us like the best leads. So I really focused on that and I, I've quashed the interviews for a little while um, the interviews are just fun. So I'm going to start them yeah. again because they're fun. Cause like I get to talk to, let's say, you know, we're talking, it's fun. Um, so I said, you know, maybe I could do, let's say two interviews a month just cause I enjoy doing it. I like talking to people and it, it's, it's almost like a form of learning for me when I'm talking to somebody, they, they, they educate me about something. Uh, so, so I'll, I'll start that again, but, uh, the main kind of content, uh, form for the channel for now is really, very tactical, very marketing, very how to be efficient in your business kind of thing. Amazing. Amazing. And where could people find more about um, you and about uh, your business or or the YouTube channel or where could people go to find out more about you and what you're up to? So I'm on like all social media platforms. <laughs> you can type my name, Maria Sparagis. You can S P A R A G I S if you need to find that. So my YouTube channel, uh, you could just, you know, put my name on YouTube and you'll find it. Same thing with Apple podcast and every uh, social platform and the company uh, that I own. My company is direct pay net. So direct pay uh, And, you know, go visit our blog and let us know, let me know how we're doing. 
yeah. anything else we should talk about. Go listen to the, the AI, the AI Maria. Yes. On, I'm actually curious. I would be a curious if people can recognize the difference. Uh, the difference. Yeah. Like I, I, I actually put it out there to some of my family members. Uh, there was one thing, which I'm not going to say that my sister noticed that was like, Hmm, uh, that sounds weird. You know, she mm. said something, but, uh, nobody else knew they that's listened wild. to the audio. They were like, Oh yeah, that's good. That's a good episode. I like that. Da, da, da. And I was like, that's amazing. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so happy, you know, that's but wild. like I said, you need, you need an editor. You need an editor to kind of fix that up a little bit speed wise, tempo wise of the voice. Sure. Sure. Awesome. Well, Maria, thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing everything that you did. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure having you with us. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Okay. Bye-bye.